Welcome to section nine, interfaces. In this section, we're gonna be looking at what is an interface, but also look at how to declare new interfaces. There are some already that you get from standard packages and so on. And when we look at how to declare an interface, we'll see that it looks very similar to a struct. So we'll wanna understand what is the difference between an interface and a struct. Then we're gonna look at implementing an interface. Slightly more advanced topic, we'll look at using interfaces with functions. Along the way, towards the end, in sort of the advanced part of things, we're gonna to try to understand what is a method set. This is gonna be important for us to be able to determine when we should use T versus star T. Now, T here represents a type, any type that we can create, and star T represents a pointer to that type. And so we'll see what method set has to do with these two types because remember t is a type and star t is also a type for lecture one the topics are what is an interface what are the differences between interface and structure and declaring an interface for us to understand what is an interface i think it's best that we come at this from why do we have interfaces and what they're used for an interface defines the set of operations or methods that are available. A type can implement or provide operations for several interfaces. So there are two things here. An interface defines the set of operations and methods that are allowed. Let's take out operation, just simply say the set of methods that are available for a type. And you can say that a type can implement or provide the methods for one or more interfaces. And so for example, if we have this type called worker as our interface, and we'll look at defining interfaces in a minute on declaring interfaces, but let's just say type worker, and now we've defined the method or this function that says work, which means that a worker can do work, which means anything that implements this interface worker must have this exact method signature called work, which means given an object or a value that implements the interface worker, we can call the method work. That is what we're saying. Notice how an interface looks similar to a struct. So here is a struct for review. If we compare that to an interface, it looks very similar. But the difference there, of course, in the first line is the keyword. Instead of using a struct keyword, we use the interface keyword. But notice something else. In structure, we're talking about fields and their type. So we're talking about how things are laid out in memory, which means that if you create a structure variable, what do you expect to see in memory? And we expect to see in memory a set of byte laid out so that we can store a name value, we can store a float value, and we can store a time value. That's what structure does, it lays out memory for us, or it tells us how memory is laid out. With in an interface, however, we're saying this is what you can call, or these are the methods you can call. So you cannot put functions inside of structs in Go, and you cannot put fields inside of interfaces. The two things are distinct. And so here's some text for you to help remember that. Structure defined memory layout of a type, the memory footprint, if you like. How much memory do I need to store all these fields that belong to the struct? And an interface define what operations are available. So now that we have an idea about what interfaces are and how they differ from structs, let's go take a look at some code to see how we define or declare interfaces. So here I'm my Visual Studio Code Editor, and we're looking at section nine, of course, and lecture one. And let's close the Explorer so we can give ourselves some room. So if you look at what I've pasted here, you'll see that I have type empty, and that's the name of my type and I'm calling it interface. Notice that I can easily change this to struct and now a struct called empty and I can run this code. And let's just do that. And it tells me that I have an empty struct object and it's empty type from the main package. Now let's go back to our code and change this now from struct to interface and that's the only thing i'm going to change and now let's run this and see the difference and notice how the value is nil so the value of an uninitialized interface variable is nil this is sort of similar 
to a pointer. If you have a pointer how it's nil, a map it's nil, a slice is nil, channel is nil, same thing. The other thing that's different than a pointer though, are those all those other types, is that even when they're nil, the type would still tell you that oh, it's you know type of whatever. Whereas here, we it's saying the type is nil. How is the type nil? How is that possible? The type is clearly type interface empty, but yet we get that the type is nil. And so if you don't remember, let's just do for a review, let's do, we expect its value to be nil, but the type should still say pointer to int. And when we run this, that's exactly, there is a type, but that's not the case when we're using an interface. So this is a variable E whose type of MD and MT being the name of that interface, yet the type is um, nil. So at least we know how to declare or define the most basic interface, and that's an empty interface. It's an empty interface that has nothing in it. And we'll see towards the end how this empty interface actually plays a really, really important role. And I'll give you a sneak peek of that in the next bit of code. My empty interface is still the same. I have now put it on one line, but still empty interface. And we have variable of that in interface. We should expect it to be nil because we haven't initialized it. And the type of it is still saying nil, which we do not understand yet, but we'll see later how this is important. But I have assigned the numeric value seven to E. And without explaining it, just take it on faith that I can do this and I don't have a red wriggly line to tell me there's an error and we'll try and run this code and we'll see. So I've assigned the value seven to E, this empty interface type. And now we'll check and see what the type of E is and its value, of course. Now its value, we should expect to be seven if I can actually do this. And or its type, we'll see what the type is. And notice I still use E, this variable of an empty interface to assign a string. This is very, very weird so far. And again, we're gonna understand it towards the end of the section, I promise. But for now, just take it on faith that this empty interface is magical. I can store certain, almost any value. Well, I can store any value in a variable of an empty interface. And so let's run this code and see. And so you can see at first it's nil nil, but now the value of that E variable, it says that seven, which we expect how we store seven in, in, in that um, variable E, and the type is int. So for an interface value, it stores two things. It stores the value that you assign it and the type of that value. And that's why when we store a string, well, it accepts the string value and it also says, oh, I know what type this is. It's type string. And you can store, you can store anything. So for example, I have a float variable and F and I take the address of it and store it in E. And so I do new currency and I will store that also in E. And let's run our code. And notice the value of E is this address because we took the address of F and notice the type of it is pointed to float 64, which again is correct. E is a variable of interface and that interface happens to be empty so therefore it doesn't dictate what can be stored that's why we can store anything so hopefully by now your intrigue even if you don't understand at least your intrigue and think that interfaces are really really cool so let's look at these examples so i have a few interfaces that i'm declaring first one is the reader interface and you'll notice a pattern in go which is the name of the interface usually end in er and then if it's a one method interface, well, the method takes the form without the ER. So this is the reader interface with a read method. This is a writer interface with the write method. This is my circle interface. And for a circle, what I'm saying is anything that says it's a circle or anything that implements this circle interface or must provide these two methods, it could provide other methods, but it must provide these two methods. A method for me to ask was the radius of that circle and return a float 64 and ask for the area of that circle on that object, okay? And it should return an area. If it does not provide these two methods, even if it provides just one of them, it is not a circle. So an interface is like a contract that 
in order for you to say that oh, you're an interface, you must fulfill the contract or all the methods of that interface. And we have another interface called rectangle. And notice what I'm showing is previously we, looked, we saw an empty interface. We now we see examples of interfaces that just have one method and some of them have different types of return values. And we can actually specify that our method takes parameter two, but we didn't have that here. But we can easily say, it, for example, that this takes a slice of byte and return some count of integer that was able to read into that buffer and if there was some error. So that is allowed, right? And we can change our string function signature also to say it takes a slice of byte to be written into whatever it is that implements that interface, okay? So you can imagine I have a file that implements the writer interface and calling this method write on that file says, well, I can write your bytes into the file and it returns how many of the bytes it was able to write to the file or if there was an error. Similarly, we can do imagine the same thing with the reader interface. If I have a file that implements the reader interface, I can say, here's a buffer, read some data from the file into this buffer, and it can tell me, well, was it able to read all the bytes that I specified based on the length of my slice here? Was it able to read all the, the bytes into that buffer? And if there was an error, reading it. Same thing we can do with circle. Notice how you can mix and match these as you see fit. For example, I might create a variable of, you know, a reader interface called some data source. And this is where I expect to be able to read data because I just want the, to be able to call the read method. And so I would initialize this data stores variable with an appropriate object that implements this interface. And we'll see that in future lecture, how we can do that. Or I might have a printer variable to represent some writer. And all I'm saying is this variable will store the value of any object that implements the right interface, print out the type of it again. And it's of course going to be nil nil for all of them because we haven't assigned anything. So if you look at this example now, it's not very different than what we had before. In the previous example, I had area as a function defined in my circle interface and in my rectangle interface. But now I have pulled that common function for these two interfaces out into another interface called shape. I said one of the things you'll see in Go is that we prefer small interfaces, which means interfaces that have one or two functions, or if it's three, but a minimum number of functions. Ideally, if you can make an interface with one function, it's going to get reused more often than if you had an interface with more functions. And we'll talk about why that is later. And so it might seem counterintuitive that these super simple interfaces would be used more often than if you had a f interface which defined a, a bunch of other functions. I have pulled out the area function into a, just a shape interface, and now I've embedded that interface into the other interface. So we can do embedding of interfaces, which means simply using an interface within another interface. So this is a simple way for us to composite the interface definition, because now I can say that a circle essentially is a shape in addition to being able to provide the radius. And rectangle also is a shape, also being able to provide the width. And, and we don't have any code because right now we're not looking at how to get any values that we can store. We're just simply talking about defining interfaces and then creating variables of it. So that's it. No exercise for this lecture. Practice defining some interfaces. Come up with some simple things that you think that represent work that can be done or operations that you can call on an object and turn it into an interface, whether it's things like opening a file, opening a database, like you can have open, the opener interface, the closer interface, right? The printer interface, those sort of things. Check out um, the reading material for interfaces. Bye. See you in the next lecture. Welcome to lecture two in section nine. In this lecture, we'll be looking at implementing interfaces. In the previous lecture, we just looked at what is an interface, how you define one, and then how you create a variable of an interface. Quick review. Structures define the how memory is laid out for a type. An interface says which operation or method you can call on a value that implements that interface. So another thing I would like us to review is method. 
and specifically what is a method and we covered this back in section two i believe and we said a method is a function that takes a receiver so the example we use to demonstrate this is to create our own type called currency we can attach a method to a value of currency by creating a function with the name string notice the uppercase s there and that is because as you remember from in go you use uppercase to mean that how it's exported or public which means somebody out who's using this value outside of this package that whatever package we're using can call this method and so that's why it's uppercase s for string and it returns a string so that is just a function the dark red is the name of our function which is capital string it takes no argument and return a string but if we look between the function name and the func keyword that is what we call the receiver and here we see the receiver simply looks like a parameter that you would normally pass to the function but instead it comes before and it says that our, our parameter is c of type currency value and that is because we are attaching this method string to that and that is the link that is how you attach a method to a to your type or a value of that type and so we can see that since c is just a currency it's really just a copy so if you have a currency value and you invoke the that string method on it a copy of that value a copy of that value is going to be passed to the string function so here's an example we create a variable c that is of type currency and we assign it the value 11.04 because remember the underlying type for currency is float so when we're creating it we can assign it this way and then we can then print it out by invoking the string method explicitly on that currency value. And so it gets printed out as dollar sign 11 that's zero four. So now that we've reviewed, once we define a type, we can attach measure to them. It should be clear that oh, you cannot attach methods to any of the existing type like float 64 or anything, because those are not defined in your package. So you cannot attach attach method to something that's not defining a package that you in the package itself here are some functions and but right now all we have are these functions but we can sort of derive some interfaces we can say anything that quacks and waddle will say is a duck and we'll represent that with a duck interface we're saying that anything that has this function uppercase string and returns a string we'll call it stringer that's what we'll call it um, we're lazy and so if it's a one method function whatever the method is or function is we'll just call the interface er of that so no surprise if we wanted an interface to just have this one function read we'll call it the reader interface and similarly the writer interface i put that there to sort of now try and give you some idea of how once you have some functions by themselves they might not mean a whole lot but if you start grouping them onto interfaces, then they start telling you something. Like a quack and waddle there together says, oh, you know, this is a duck. But by itself, quack doesn't necessarily mean anything. Or waddle by itself probably doesn't tell you a whole lot, right? So let's imagine now that we actually had methods. Function, string, which had the receiver currency. And so we see our read person has the read method, but file also has the string method and also to find a write method in this example. And so we can start drawing some lines. We can say that currency implements the interface stringer. That's it. We've been implementing interfaces before. We just didn't call it implementing. We just say we were attaching methods to type. And this is exactly what implementing an interface is. Now, why, are we imp why do we know that currency implements the interface stringer? Because currency defined the method string with the same exact signature as that one method in our stringer interface. So long as a type as all the method defined by an interface, that type implements that interface. And so we can see also that person implements two interfaces. It implements the interface stringer and the interface reader. Similarly, our file here implements the stringer interface and the writer interface, all by the mere fact that we have attached those two methods that satisfy those two interfaces to our type file. And so the important thing to take away is a type implements an interface 
if that type provide method definition for all the functions that are declared in that interface. And so what we say is in Go, interfaces are implemented implicitly, not explicit, not like in Java or C++ or many other languages where you say, you know, currency implements stringer, for example, is something you might say, or person implements reader and stringer. Yeah, you don't have to say that. It's all implicit, because it's like magic. And so we've been implementing interfaces all the time when we did our currency, we have we implemented an interface. We just didn't really say that we did. We didn't talk about interfaces yet, so we didn't say it. Currency, by the fact that it has this one method called string, implements a stringer interface. No surprise, person, by virtue of implementing these two methods, the first one being string, it implements the stringer interface, and because it also defines the method read, it also implements the reader interface, so person implements two interfaces. File, all three interfaces, just by virtue of the fact that it has these three methods. So now that we have an idea how to implement an interface, let's see some code. So here I am in my Visual Studio code, um, section nine, and we're doing lecture two, and I'll close the explorer. And I have some code already. And it's basically what we were looking at and what we said we reviewed. And so let's run that and make sure that works. And it works and we get exactly what we say we should. Let's try something else. If you look at the code that I have now, I've added a stringer interface definition. So I say stringer is an interface and it has this method string with the signature takes no parameter and returns a string. This is stringer that I define, therefore it, this stringer type belongs to my package, which is main. If you wanted to find, a, if you want to talk about a fully qualified name for this type, it would be main that stringer, saying stringer type from the main package. That's important and we'll see that soon. Now we're making an explicit call to the string method here, but here we call it implicitly because the println and friends functions, they know how to take a value, interrogate it to see if it has a string method, and if it does, it calls it automatically. So when we run our code, we'll still get the exact same result, just as if we call C that string, because the printx functions do it for us. And we've seen this before, but it's a good reminder. So let's go on, let's run the code. And as you can see, the result is the same regardless of whether you call it explicitly, or we call it implicitly. And that's one of the reasons for having doing something like this, because then you can just use it the way you're accustomed to using values when you go to print them out and so on, without having to resort to typing something like this. So here's some new code, and I still have the types that I defined before, which is my currency type and my stringer interface type. But now I want to look at assigning a value to an interface. I have created a variable called main stringer. What is main stringer? It's a variable of my type stringer. And remember this type stringer is because it's in my package main. So that's why I call this variable main stringer. And I will assign to my main stringer variable this value C. Now, why can I assign this? This is currency value being assigned to an interface. The reason I can store the value stored in C in main stringer is because the value stored in C is for a type currency that implements the, all of the method that my main that stringer type requires. Keep in mind that we said before that an interface variable stores a value and a type. Here's another example. I create another variable. This variable is for FMT that stringer. The FMT package define its own stringer. And notice its stringer looks exactly like the stringer I define in main. The two of them are exact signature, but they're two different stringers. Value of C can be stored in variable of either one. That is because the value stored in C implements the methods required by FMT stringer. And so we can take that same very same value and store it in two different interface variables. And so let's run our code. And as we can see, 
main string of value is 11.04, which we know, um, that's the value. And the type of that was main currency. Here, when we use the FMT stringer, it still get the same value, but notice it still says main that currency because that is the value that is storing. It's storing the same value, even though this variable that we use in FMT stringer was actually from the format package stringer, but they both can store the same value. Variable of an interface stores two things, a value and a type. And so once you assign a value to it, it knows the value, of course, and it also knows the type of that value that you store in it. And that is exactly what's happening here. But the only time you can store a value into an interface variable is if that value implements all of the method of that interface. I'll, I'll prove that to you. So one of the other things I want to look at is how we implement an interface using a pointer to the type. Well, this is the same code I had before. I haven't changed it yet. So as you can see, this is my type called currency, and I've used the currency type to implement this interface. Now, what this means is that we can also use the pointer. But before I do that, let me show you something else. What if we created a pointer instead and said new, we have C is equals to new currency. Well, we know this is going to create a pointer. And then we can dereference C and store. And now we can dereference it and store the value 11.04. So let's run this and see. Notice how it still works, but notice what is stored in our interface variables. Well, this is the value still, but we are storing a pointer to that currency type. So we can certainly use either an object of type currency or a value of type currency or a pointer of type currency and still call the method. But that doesn't mean that we have implemented that interface for the pointer type. It just means we can still get to use the method if we have a pointer. But let me show you the difference. So let's call this C and we'll create another variable called C1. And C1 will be just simply this. And we'll say currency equals to 11.04. We'll call it C1. And we will try to print it out also. So let's do this. So we'll say C1, C1. Okay. And maybe we should make this a little bit more friendly by doing this. Okay, so now we have C and C1. Okay, so what I want to do is notice I'm using a pointer to invoke C, that string, and we went through already why we don't have to dereference C here, even if it's pointer, because Golang is helping us to not actually type too much. It says, oh, I see you want to call invoke the string method. Okay, fine, it's a pointer. I know how to deal with it. I can dereference it for you. So we don't have to be explicit. But okay, let's run this and it still works good so we've seen this before it should work we use either the value or the pointer okay but we still implemented this interface stringer using the type t let's implement this interface now using the type t pointer to type so that's all we we have to do now of course if we do that since c is a pointer we can't cast a pointer to a float rather what we have to do is dereference the pointer and cast that value to a float64. So now I'm using the same way to print out both values. And I want you to see the difference. So let's clear our screen, run the code. And notice when I use the pointer, I get the DAO sign. But when I use the value, I do not get the DAO sign. I get it if I call it explicitly but I do not get it. And just to understand well, we'll see that why it's working this way. We'll see that in another lecture. Essentially, what is happening is because we've defined 
our implementation on the pointer type, when we call it explicitly, of course, we were trying a string here. So this is just a string, so this work. But when we pass that value now to the printf function, it gets a copy of that value, but it gets a copy of a currency, not a pointer to a currency. And when it looks at a currency, it does not see an implementation for string because we did not define an implementation for string on a currency. We define an implementation of string on a pointer to a currency. And so that's why the printf function cannot invoke the string method because it is not available for a currency. It's only available for a string, a pointer for a currency, sorry, not for a currency. So you might be wondering why did it work the previous time when we had it the other way. So for example, if we take out the currency definition and we say, let's implement it for the type instead of the currency pointer, why is it that this will work now? Why is it that the printf function will still be able to call the string method on the print for the pointer, even though we did not define the string method for a pointer? And so we can see this by running our code. And we'll explain why that is. So notice it works for printer, for a pointer, and it doesn't work for the value when we do it the other way. So again, this video or this example is about how to implement the interface with a pointer. We see there's a difference. We don't understand why, but we'll examine it. So that is all there is to it in terms of implementing an interface for a pointer versus for the type, okay? For star t versus t is you simply either accept a pointer value or you don't. If it's invoked on a regular uh, non-pointer value, well, of that type, then go still cause it explicitly. All right. Now, let's look at our final example. And this will show you why one reason why it's good to be able to use a pointer as your receiver. So for this example, I went back and picked up our code from section eight and lecture four. And the example we did was example six. And that had to do with a document. And we said that what if we had a document and we can pass a document as a pointer to a function and we look at the benefit of that. So I copied that example and now I want to ask the question, what if those methods that we had to work on a document those functions, sorry, that we had to work on a document, like printing a document that accepted a document as a parameter, why don't we just turn those into methods? And of course, it just simply means transposing that parameter, the document parameter, to a method call. And so we can see that here, for example, print document, this used to be here as a parameter, and I simply move it back here to be a receiver. And that's all I had to do to this function signature. Everything else remained the same. And so I did that with all the functions except load doc because we want load document to just return a new document. But for printing a document and list, list headings and all these things, I just simply move that pointer parameter to a receiver. Now, this is not going to cause our code to go slower or faster really because it's still a pointer parameter and we already benefited from the fact that we're using a pointer instead of copying. Now, where we can go back to being slow is if we say we wanted a document, which would cause what? A copy to occur, right? But we went through that already and realized that, you know what? Document is a very big thing. We do not want to pass a copy of it. Rather, we want to pass around a pointer. Now, when it comes to printing a document, we really don't need to modify the document. So should we still accept a pointer? In this case, yes, because a document is very big. But that's why Go gives you the ability to choose whether or not you should implement an interface or when you define methods, whether you choose to accept a value of type T or a pointer to T. It wants you to be able to make that um, distinction and know how your code is being called and when you should do it. So even though we're not going to be changing a document, well, we still pass a pointer because we know it's really big and we just don't want to take the copy cost. Okay, so let's run this, make sure it runs, and it runs exactly the same way as the previous example would work, like I said, and we can compare it to see the difference. 
So I'll select the example and say select for compare. And then I'll select our code and say compare with selected. And if I close our example, close this again. As you can see, the difference are the differences are in how it's called. Instead of saying printer doc, we now say a doc that print. Instead of saying word count doc a doc, we say a doc dot word count. Similarly, instead of taking two parameters to this function, we now take one parameter because we can call it on that object. We can call capitalize on that value and therefore we don't have to pass it same thing with print again and list editing so those are the only thing that change in turn in main in terms of the implementation is just as i showed before you take the what was previously a parameter and since this is the only parameter now you move it to a receiver and your function doesn't have a parameter and it's going to be the same for capitalize and print the only one that's slightly different is the document list, list heading, sorry. But again, very, very straightforward. That's the only thing that changed, function signature. The rest of it remained the same. And so now we can see how we can easily move from having functions to having methods. This is cleaner because these functions were doing things on this document. So it makes sense that we should tie them to the document. Now in this example, they're low case, so which means if somebody tried to use my document, outside of my main package, they will not be able to call, even if they have a document value, they won't be able to call these methods, you know, list and print, but I can easily fix that by making these methods capital. Okay, well, on this side. Um, so let's go back to our code. And so I'll close this whole code. And so, yes, we see how easy it is to go from functions that take the parameter to just turn them into method. And we saw from the diff between the two pieces of code that it was just in the function signature in this case because I was already accepting a pointer. But if I was accepting just a document object in my previous implementation, similarly, it would have just been the function signature. So that's it um, in terms of implementing an interface. Hopefully, you find this exciting. We do have an exercise and I'll cover that in the supplemental video. Take care, see you in the next lecture. Bye. So let's look at your exercise for section two, lecture two. We'll go down to the stop directory, go into exercise two, and we'll start with the readme. And it says that you're to complete the Go application. So I give you a stop application, which you can see some of the code um, is already in these directories. I'll show you in a bit some of it. And you're to complete this application. This application implements interf the interface vehicle type. So I've defined a vehicle type interface, and this is what a vehicle interface look like. And it's pretty self-explanatory if you sort of just know a little bit about cars, that they have a make, which is manufacturer, and the model, which is the specific um, year model for that make. So for example, Ford is a maker of vehicles, so they'd have several models. And then like Ford Explorer, they would have the same Ford Explorer coming out different years. Of course, not the exact same one, but that model would appear several years. And maybe they did the first time it appears, you know, maybe 1990 or something, and then they stopped making it after a few years. But basically, that's the idea. Um, each vehicle have a seating capacity because um, a Ford Explorer is different than a under pilot, for example, or a Tesla Model 3. And type. Type refers to whether it's a sedan, a pickup, that sort of thing, four-door or, or SUV. The powertrain re refers to whether it's electric, gas, or hybrid as described here. So pretty much everything you need to know about a vehicle is described by this interface, which it should be. That's what an interface does. And so now we just need to implement this interface to get the specifics about each other vehicle. Okay, the vehicle types. Now, let's go back to the readme. So the first to do says to, given the interface vehicle, which I just went over, complete the application by implementing the vehicle's interface for the types Ford Explorer, Honda Pilot, Acura TSX, and Tesla Model 3. 
As a hint, I suggest that you break your application up into packages. That way you don't have all these types and the entire application in one big main package. And that is what I did here in my example solution. I've broken it up into packages. I have a package for Tesla, Honda, Ford, Acura, and my main that Go goes into this command directory. We haven't been doing it, but if you look at most Go application, you'd see the structure where we have within the project directory, a number of packages directory, and a CMD directory with your main application. So your main that Go now will simply import those packages, right? Or Acura, Ford, Honda, Tesla, and vehicle, and use that within the main application. So now our main application is very simple. And so we can see in this main application, what we do is create a slice of vehicle. Why we want to cycle vehicle um, variables? Well, because we want to be able to store the value for each one of these specific types that we implement the interface for. Now, this is not going to work now because we have missing methods. But once I have that, let's assume that works, I can then iterate over each value of this vehicle slice and print it out. And I can do that by asking the FMT package to print it out. So let's run this code and see what happens. And it fails. It says that our different packages, like you know, Ford that Explorer, for example, does not implement the vehicle method because they are missing method and it tells you which method is missing. So for now, let's comment this out because it's not there and we want to try and run the code. So that's why we'll comment it out. So let's try and run the code again. And now we see that I'm supposed to have four vehicles and of course this is not printed out correctly. So let me address why the output is, looks like this and why there's a nil. So if we go back to the requirements from our interface, it says that a vehicle year should be between 1910 and today's and the current year. If we look in our main method, we'll see that we try to get a Ford Explorer that is 1900, and that is wrong. Now, we can go look at the implementation of this, but I suggest that you try implementing at least one type first by yourself, just using the interface alone. Just try that, see how far you get, and then if you're stuck, of course, go look at the application, the solution that I have, or start with this stub. And so what I did was I have this function. This is a function in the package forward that says I want a new explorer. And that's because you can imagine that, oh, since this is the maker forward, and maybe they have other cars like the Fiesta or the F1 pickup or something like that, I can say new Fiesta or new F1 pickup and pass some set of values to create a variable or a value, sorry, of that appropriate um, type. So, okay, so that's the idea. But since this is incorrect, let's change it to, I think the, nine, the Ford Explorer probably showed up in the 1980s. So it would be nice if this tells us why it's failing. And it says invalid year for Ford Explorer. So somewhere in the implementation of this function, it knows when is the valid year for Ford Explorer. And of course, this would be invalid too because this is past the current year, but maybe um, 2009, maybe I'll get lucky. I have a valid Ford Explorer. So these are my five, four values now here. Um, the nil is from the fact that I have a nil error. So that's this, okay? So somewhere between there was the valid year. I hit the sweet spot and my error message could have been a lot clearer by telling me what the valid range is, but those are improvements you can certainly make. But at least now I have four valid values. Okay, so why is it printing out this way? Well, that's because we have not implemented the stringer interface. And that is part two of your exercise, which is not to only complete the missing method, which as we know, will include the powertrain. So let's put that back. But also we need to implement stringer that for FMT that stringer interface. And you know all about that already. We talk about it during the lecture, lecture two. So implement that. Now let me show you what your application should sort of look like. It doesn't have to be exact because you could choose 
what order you want to print out the different values and so on, but or fields for a vehicle. But let me give you a sample of my solution. So let's clear our screen and I will run my solution. And you can see when I created those vehicles, well, because I use an invalid value for the year, if I have an Explorer, even if the year is invalid, that is still made by Ford and it's still a four door SUV and it's still seat five and it's still powered by gas. The fact that I, it's invalid, I don't know the year, however. So that's my choice, how I choose to implement. But you could choose that if the year is invalid, should you even return a valid um, object? Or if the object is nil, should it print out any such values? Those are all your implementation choices. And I'm using the interface variable to store values of types that implement that interface. And now I can iterate through the slice and we see something that look like polymorphism if you know about object-oriented programming and C++ and languages like Java and so on, you say, oh, there's polymorphism. And we'll talk a little bit more about how Go ditch dispatches the function call. Welcome to lecture three in section nine. In this lecture, we're gonna be talking about method set. We're going to cover what is a method set and the two types of method sets you can have. You can have a method set for the type T, and we'll compare that to the method set for the type star T. And when I say T versus star T, all I mean is T is some type that you know of, and star T is a pointer to that type. So then what is a method set? So I would say the method set is the set of method that can be selected for a value or interface variable. Now, I'm making the distinction here between a value and an interface variable because we know that when we have an interface as a type, that the only thing you can do with an interface is implement it or create a variable of that interface. You cannot create a value. So if we focus on value, if you have a value, we know it must have a type and the meta set for that value is all the methods that you can call by saying value that and then whatever set of methods you have. If we're talking about the interface variable, so if I is an interface variable of the interface type I, we notice it's capital I, then I's, the lowercase i, method set, the variable method set, is all the methods defined for that interface I. We've seen this before. If we have an interface called stringer with one method string, if we create an interface variable, when we do s dot, the only methods we're gonna see that we can call is that one method that's defined on the interface. So for interface variable, it method set is just the set of methods that's defined for the interface. Previous slide, that was my way of explaining what a method set is. If we look at the Go language specification in the section on method set, you'll find these sentences. Now, I've picked out the sentences verbatim. I just selected the ones that I think most illustrate and help to convey what a method set is. If there were things in there that didn't really talk to a method set, I sort of left it out. But in your reading assignment, please do go read the entire thing. So with that said, this is all from the Google language specification. A type may have a method set associated with it. So let's try and understand what it means. Notice may. A type may have a meta set associated with it, which means that if you have a type, like we have created the type social security number, and we want to introduce it into the program to help with the implementation, to convey the idea of this thing being a separate type, but we didn't have to have meta attached to it, right? So that's why it said it may have a meta set associated with it. So the method set of an interface type, if it is its interface, we've just said that. We said that if you have an interface variable, well then the methods that you can call in that interface variable are the methods that are defined for the interface. The method set of any type T consists of all methods declared with receiver type T, which is the exact same thing we said. We just didn't spell it out this way. When we had a currency type and we created the stringer method for it, we had a receiver, right? That's a receive currency. Well, it means that though the method set for currency was that method string that was defined for it. Now notice this has none to do with implementing an interface. When you have a type and you have methods to it, 
the only way you get implementation is if there happens to be an interface which have the same set of a subset of those methods. But other than that, you can add methods to a type and it has nothing to do with interface. Okay, you're not you don't have to try and match an interface if you're not trying to implement the interface. So all we're saying is the method set is all the methods attached to that type. We go further. It says the method set of the corresponding pointer type, star t, is the set of methods declared with the receiver star t, makes sense, and the methods that are declared for the t. So notice that the method set for star t includes both the methods that are declared for star t and the methods that are declared for t. Also note that though this does not apply to t. When you have when you look at the method set for t, it just includes the type that are declared for t, not the types that are declared for star t. So it's not a two way sort of relationship. It only works one way. And we'll illustrate that with some example. Very slowly and painfully, we'll go through some examples and reiterate this over and over until hopefully it becomes second nature and it's clear why this is the case. And finally, any other type, right? So if there's there, if you have 10 types, and eight of them have methods defined for them, whether the methods are on T or star T, but two of those types doesn't have any methods, then we say the method sets for those type is empty, which applies back to that very first bullet point that says a type may have a method set. And if it may, then means that oh, some types just don't have a method set. And this is the case of you know the type string or the type Boolean. They don't have method sets. If you have a variable of type string or Boolean and you do dot, you don't get a list of methods that you can call. So Go is not like fully object-oriented languages like Ruby or Python, those languages where you can invoke methods on you know, things like strings or even a numeric value. So let's start off by saying we have a type, and here our type is person, and it says type struct. And we'll ignore for the moment what's inside a struct because it doesn't really matter. All we care about is the type person. And we know that oh, we can define some methods on this person. So we attach the method name. And how do we know that name is in the method set for the type person? Because the name method has as its receiver type person. So that's why. We can also define a method and have its receiver be pointer to person. And so that's our set age is a method of that type that where its receiver is pointed a person. So then we can ask the question now, what is the method set for these two types? So the method set for person is just the name method because that's what was defined for that on the, as a receiver, having receiver for that for person type. What is the method set for star person or pointed a person? Well, it's set age, but remember what it said. It says it also includes the methods that are defined for person. So the method set for star person includes both the methods defined for the pointer person and for those defined for the person itself. And we'll see, like I said, through examples why this makes sense or why. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor for you know, section nine, lecture zero three. Let's close this up, give ourselves some room as usual. And so I have a very simple application for Go program. I have my struct person with some fields and I have a composite literal store the value in mark. We can ask ourselves, what if we had the method name to our type person or method set before this, our method set is empty. Meaning that if I say mark that, you see what I get as in my selection? Just the field names. I do not get any method, just field names. So I can say then that the method set for person at this moment is empty. But if I do this, now we know that the method set for type person includes the method called name. And we can prove this by now being able to call this function name on a value of that type person. And of course this will run because we've done this before. We've done this too many times, All right? 
No, of course, we don't have to stop, stop there. We can add more methods to the method set of person. So now that we have a second method in our method set for person, we can, of course, call that method two. And this will also work, no surprise. So now that we have two methods in the method set for person, let's see how it is that we can add a new method to the method set star t, because right now the method set for star t only contains these two. Or what we're gonna do is simply add a method to the method set of star, star person. So now we have two method sets, a method set for person and a method set for star person. And I know this is repetitive, but I really want you to understand it. That's why I keep repeating it. Hopefully with all the repetition, you'll get it. So let's look at our set H function. It takes a pointer and we really should test that our pointer is not null, but to keep the code simple, we're not doing that. And we're going to confirm or verify that the age we're being asked to set is less than 150 and is greater than the current age, right? So we're not gonna allow a person to go back in age. And then we can write out some message that we are set changing it from this to that, and then we change it. Okay, so now that we have a method in the method set for star t, if the documentation is correct and what I said is correct, is that if we have this value that is of type t, we should not be able to call a method that is in the star t. But we don't have an error for this. So is this really working? Let's run it and see. And it does work. And we, we can call set age, which is defined in the method set star person on this value that is of type t. But this, this is not supposed to work. Well, what you can imagine is what you're seeing is syntactic sugar, which is just code that the language allow you to write that sort of hides something else that's going on. So this is equivalent to since we have a value, we have a value, we know that it's stored in memory, and it's a value for which we can get the address, this is the exact same thing as if we took the address of our value, stored it in another variable, and then call set age using that pointer because at this point, m is now a pointer. So that means set age is in the method set for m. So now we can call it. This is sort of what is happening behind the scenes, even though we are allowed to type this. So it's not really that set age is in the method set of type T, it's the fact that, you know what? For, for mark, we can, this value, we can get its address. So behind the scene, we're getting the address and then invoke it at set age. So that works, okay? And so we can print out and show that how the age was updated. If we rerun this, we can see that our mark's age was 35 here. We call the method and we are affecting that um, value. Um, that is stored in memory because we can get the memory address. So let's look at this example. I haven't changed much. We in terms of main, the only thing I'm doing is I create a composite literal value, take the address of it, and I store that in a variable p. So p is a pointer to a person. The method set for p, if we ask the question, what is the method set for p? Well, it's all three of these, right? It's the one that's defined for pointer to a person, but it also picks up the other two for person. And so we wanna understand how that is the case. And so if we try to call a method name on P, why is this working? Well, the language says it is, but really what's happening? Well, we learn with pointers, if you have a pointer and you try to call something on that pointer, like a field or in this case, a function, if that pointer is non-nil, if it's not nil, if it's valid in other words, go dereferences that pointer and call the thing. So this is exactly the same as if we had explicitly dereference the pointer and call the thing because P is a valid pointer. So once we dereference it, what do we have? We have object person, right? We have the person. And then that object has in its meta set name. So hence why we can say that the method set for P includes the methods that are in T because we can always dereference a valid pointer. So long as it's not non-nil, we can dereference it. And so that's why. And so that's why we're able to make this call and we can run this code and it works of course. We can then access any method 
in the message set for t because similarly we can just say that oh this is means that oh, we're dereferencing p and then we can get access to age which is also in the meta set of person it's in the meta set of person and so that's sort of like what's happening behind the scene when it comes to calling the method set age well we know this is defined for pointer to p it allows me to make this call and of course if i make the call then I can of course get the age and so if we run this we'll see that our mark's age was increased because we are using a pointer this so far doesn't prove why t does not include the meta set of star t right it shows that oh why star t includes the meta set of t because we could always dereference a valid star t and just get t and then we can just call the methods but the other way we haven't proven yet so let's get to that so I've simplified the code a little bit. I only took away a few lines because we don't need all of them, but I still leave what we were talking about before, which is essentially, if we have a value of t, type t, or a person in this case, when we see mark that set age, what's really happening behind the scene is syntactic sugar. So let's demonstrate why the method set of t does not include the methods from star t. Above, doesn't seem to prove it. Keep in mind, the keyword is because we can take the address of this variable or this value, that's why we can invoke the meta sets in star t. So we can get a pointer, that's what we're using. But we're not always gonna be able to get a pointer. So an example of when you're not gonna be able to get a pointer is for example, when we have a map. And so here I have a map of string to person. And so this is called my family and so I have mom as a person in the family and name is jane smith and you know dad let's say okay and i use a map composite literal to create this value so what if i wanted to print out all the members of family well i can just simply iterate over that family using the range operator and print it out so i print out the family members and name and age of course and so we could run that and this is what it looks like Okay, nothing there. Nothing interesting. What about if I wanted to increment the age of each family member? Well, that should be straightforward. I can simply range over the family member, and since I have this value that represents the family member, I want to show you that I can still get the address of that value. That's why I'm getting them just printed out. But now I can call P. Notice P is not a pointer. P is a person. It's not pointer to a person. P is a person. And for that, I can get called P set age because what will happen is this syntactic sugar above. Since I can get the address of this person, then in effect behind the scenes, it's going to get the address of P and then say, oh, in this pointer, this pointer to a person, there is set age. And so um, I can call it. And so that is exactly what happened. And so this call also succeeds. Okay, so it's successful. So look at that. We Jane is 42 and look like we were setting our age to 43. Well, there's something misleading here. Let's actually print out after we've run through set increasing their age. Let's now print out the family information again and see if the age actually changed. So let's clear up our screen and rerun this. And you can see that no, the age didn't change, even though we said it was changing here. So what happened? What happened was when we range over family, we got a copy, a copy of that element in P. And we were able to get the address of that copy, P, which is local to this loop. And that's why we were able to set the age on that copy. But we did not af affect or change the family member inside this map. And the reason why is a map does not allow you to get the address of the element in it. And we can see this because we can say, okay, so this did not work. What about if we say, for example, let's get the key for each element. And then why don't we just explicitly just do this? We just say family. And now we can say for that object in the family, let's call set age on it. And you'll see that we'll get an error. Notice what it says. Cannot call pointer method because the method we're trying to call is set age pointer method on family r why because family r is person not a pointer to a person and it tells you you cannot take the address of family r so this brings us back to what i said before 
that the only reason this worked is because we can get the address of mark. Because mark represents a value where we can get the address of it, it is not a value that's inside of a map. So why doesn't a map allow you to get the address of the thing in it? Well, because the map might have to grow. It might have to change where something, where mom or dad is stored in memory. And if it allowed you to get the memory of that value and it changed it, then your program would blow up. So you cannot, it's not because you have a value means that you can always get an address. But the opposite of that is, or the converse, is that if you have a valid pointer, you can always get the value. Hopefully you can see why it had to be this way. Because if we included in the meta test for T, those that were defined in star T, it would break in this particular instance because you couldn't get the address of it to be able to call it. You know, you can try and be even more convoluted. You can say, well, sure, we can't take the address. What if we try and be pretty explicit about it? What if we say, well, we take the, look up the value and then take the address. And then after we take the address, then we call the method, right? And so now we, we are sure that this value inside of this blue parentheses represents a pointer, but no, we, we cannot take the address of that thing. Okay, so no matter how you try to get around it, you cannot. Hopefully, these examples illustrate for you the difference between the two method sets and why we have them, why they're different, how they behave, and that gives you the opportunity to decide what should be in a method set of your type T, or for example, in our case, person, versus what should be in your meta set pointer to person. So let's go and take a look at what you can read to get more information about what we covered today. So in terms of reading material, of course, there's the Go language specification that talks about interface type. And then there's a section on method set and like I said, from that section, you'll see some of the sentences that I've already used in this lecture. Like I said, I copied them verbatim, but I just selected what I thought was important, but you should go and read all of it. There's also a section on something called assignability, which is what we're gonna cover. And you may not quite get assignability, honestly, when you read it, but if you try and read it, even if you don't get all of it, at least when we cover it later in a future lecture, it wouldn't be the first time you're seeing it, and Maybe something will stick and maybe it might make it easier. If you still have problems after looking at the, the, the video and reading about method set, please pose questions. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye. Right. So let's take a look at your exercise for lectures free. So I'll go to stubs here in section nine and then exercise three and click on the readme and let me close this for now. Given the right interface below, a value of right counter records the number of times the right method was called. Hence, the return value of right is always length of byte nil. That's because we never fail. The other thing you have to do is to do two is to implement the stringer interface for your right counter. And what it means is if you pass a right counter value to one of the print function or you call the, that string method directly, it should return how many times, like this string, for example, there were 20 right operations. Let me go over the code a little bit. So now this is some a test to test your right interface. And if you implement your right counter correctly, I can just come into this test function and click the run test button. So this should fail because we do not have the required methods implemented. That's one way for you to keep testing your code as you develop it. And then finally, when it's written, you'd go to that directory, for example, and do go run main. So that's it. Good luck. See you in the next video. Welcome to lecture four and section nine. In this lecture, we'll be looking at interfaces and functions. So our topics for this lecture are interface type as function parameters and function that return an interface type as the function return value. So let's refresh what we know about interface variable. We know that if you're given an interface, any interface, that what you can do is you can create variables of that interface type. You cannot create values of an interface, but you can create variables of that interface type. And once you have an interface variable, there are these two hidden fields that I mentioned before, and I tried to illustrate with some code to show you that 
it is the value which will a copy of whatever value you assign to that interface variable and a type again these are two hidden fields that you cannot access but we'll see that we can sort of get to it and it holds the type of that value that is assigned so if you try and remember these two things or rather these three things about interfaces I think you're going to do really well in terms of understanding a lot of other things that's going to come later. One, with an interface, you can create only variables. And once you create a variable, it has two hidden fields. The two hidden fields are so that it can keep a copy of the value you can later assign to that interface variable and the type of that value that you copy to the interface. And the reason for that is that the interface does not want to lose what type of value it is storing because you might be able to store multiple different types of values and we'll see that soon okay so this is just for illustration purposes only assume that i have a variable foo and it's a variable of an interface the interface here happened to be the empty interface so i do a literal into um, variable declaration where i say far foo type is an interface empty interface and so what that means is that somewhere in memory, I have a variable. But we know that though if this is an interface variable, it has two fields that are hidden. Those fields are going to be for the value and for the type of anything I assign to this variable foo, this interface variable foo. Right now, since I created, I haven't assigned anything, so the value and the type both have nil. Now, if I were to say foo is equals to 3.14, this is a value that I can assign or store in this interface variable. What happens then is that foo is now updated where its value is a copy of the value I assign. So since I tried to assign 3.14, well, its value field, that hidden field value for the interface variable foo has a copy of that value. And it also records the type of the value that it store as float 64 in this case, which it is, and it records that as the type. Now, if I decide to store another value in that same interface variable foo, and this time I'm storing the address to a person composite literal, well, we know that person, a variable or a value representing a person is going to be stored somewhere in memory, and then we'll get the address of that memory. But since we're creating a pointer when we use address of, well, it's not only the location in memory, but it's the type. So now foo value is a copy of whatever I was trying to store. What was I trying to store? A memory address. So the value will have that memory address. What type is this memory address? Well, it's a pointer to a person. So let's use what we know here to extend this to how we can use this with functions. So here I am at Visual Studio Code Editor, and let's start off with something we've done before. So before we go into that, though, let's just make sure that we understand the types that I have defined here. So I have a type called ID, and its underlying type is unsigned in 64. I have another type called Social Security Number. Its type is String. And then I have a struct type called Person with some fields. Finally, I have a type called Empty, which is just an interface that is empty. It doesn't define any methods whatsoever, right? So now let's look at a code and let me close this up so we can have some space. And so I have a variable E. And so if we try to print what value is in E and the type of E, we should expect nil nil because we know that when it comes to interface variable, unlike other variables, unlike other variables, interface variable, they do not have a type because what they store are values. And when you try to access it and say, what is the value or what is the type? You're asking, what is the type of the value that the interface variable is storing? And right now we don't have any value stored, but we have nil value. So therefore the type of nil is also nil. We assign a float value, float 64 value to that interface variable. And of course, now we know that what's going to happen is Behind the scenes, the two fields, hidden fields that we do not see, one, the value field is going to record a copy of this value, 
and then the type field will record the type of this value. So we should expect to see not only our value 110.04, but also the type of it as float64. Similarly, when I try to assign a value of my ID type, and I create a value for ID, and give it this number, we should expect that my interzip phase variable should have a copy of this value, and then it should correctly reflect that the type of that value is from the main package, and whose name and the type is main.id. And similarly with social security number and of course our person variable here. So let's run the code. And that's exactly what we get. That's looking good so far. So let's continue. So let's look at this code. I'll focus on this function first. So I've written a function called print info. And we know that our end goal when you have a parameter to a function is the same as if you just have a variable and you're assigning value to it. Now let's see our main function has changed. We haven't changed anything else about our code other than add this function. And now because we have a print info function that takes whose parameter is an interface variable, then we can pass values to this function that satisfy the interface. And because we're using an empty interface, let's think about it for a second. Remember that our interface is sort of like a contract. As a value, you must have in your method set the set of function that I define in my interface. But because the empty interface does not define any function, well, we can assign any value to a variable whose type is of empty interface because by definition, any value, even if it has methods, well, we don't intend to call any method through that interface anyway, so it can be assigned. It satisfies the contract. And so that's why the empty interface in Go is so powerful because it's used to be able to just assign anything um, to, to that um, variable of the empty, empty interface. So now we can pass those same values to this function. So instead of assigning them to the variable, we can just pass them to the function, but that is exactly what happens anyway. It's an assignment that happens in the function call. So it's the exact same thing as what we had before. So therefore, we should expect the result of this function to be exactly the same as the previous one. And so I'll leave the previous one on the screen and let's rerun the code. And as you can see, no difference whatsoever at all. Let's look at this piece of code. What is different between this piece of code and the previous example? Well, I can show you. What is different is I simply change the name of our function. Our function was previously called print info. And so let me show you what that function name was. It was simply called print info. That was it. And as you can see, when I type it back, all the changed markers went away. So let's reset. So by changing my function from print into info to print line, what have I done? I've written main's own print line function. Why? Because we know the print line from the Go FMT package, FUMP, accept values of any type. We've been using it to print out different types of values anyway. I can literally put FMT that in front of this and it will work the exact same way as, you know, ours, except ours prints something else because that's what the implementation is. And so notice, however, and let's, Let's do that. Um, so I will call the FMT package println function instead. So FMT that println. And so if we import that package, which we do here, notice I don't have any error. I can pass any one of these values. And if you look at the definition of the FMT println package, notice what it uh, says. It says a dot dot interface, empty interface. And that's the key. It's because it's accept, it's a variadic function that accept any number of values, which whose any number of values which satisfy the empty interface. And we know that because the empty interface is so open, it accepts any value. That's why we can pass any value regardless of if Go have seen it before, or in the case of my new type here, ID, social security number, pointer to print to person. These are types Go have never seen. These are types that I have created and yet is able to accept it and print it. And so let's clear the screen here and rerun our code. And this is what we get from 
FMT package printing out those values? Well, it doesn't tell us the type or anything, it just tries its best to print it out. But if we undo this instead and use our print lint function, notice just a different package from FMT package now to the main package, but now mine prints out that, oh, hey, you know what? You're using the main that print line. And I will tell you the value and the type of that thing you asked me to print out. And so if we rerun this, that's what we get, right? Slight variation from what we had before, except I prepend the string. But notice we have essentially implemented our own print line function. And the trick was to use an, an interface variable. And which interface variable? We specifically use the empty interface. Now, I went through the trouble of um, declaring the empty interface, but since there's nothing really in it and it's used a number of places, you don't have to type define the empty interface. So I just wanted to make a point by doing it, but you really don't have to. Okay, so let's continue. Here are the changes I've made to our code. If we focus on the print line function, I've simply changed it now to be a variadic function. Before, it wasn't a variadic function. It was this. Now, I've made it variadic. Uh, when we have a variadic function, that parameter looks like a slice. And so we can range over it. And because this is an empty interface, we can just simply say that we can pass all our values in one function call. We should expect that this worked just fine. And so I'll leave our previous code there so we can compare it. And there you go. And what I have is I rename my empty interface to printer. And in traditional Go style, what we want to be able to do is have a method now called print. So let's look now at my function. My function now says it's a variadic parameter on printer. I'll try and call the print method on each value. What is happening now is that if we try to run this code, you'll see that E is a variable of this interface, so that's fine. But since we pass in nil, when I call this function, it will actually crash when it tries to invoke nil that print. So that's gonna be a problem, but we can easily fix that. Um, what about this floating point value? Well, we said that these basic type, like numeric types, do not have methods. And so this doesn't satisfy the interface. And I should be seeing some red error message here, but you can see it telling me as though it cannot use, you cannot use this. And the same thing here, cannot use ID, cannot use social security number because they do not implement the missing method print, okay, for our printer interface. And similar here, here we can see the same thing. And so let's now implement those methods. So we'll quickly implement the method for ID. We'll add the print method to its method set. For social security number, we'll add the print method to its method set. And for the person um, struct, we'll add the print method to its star D or pointer uh, to person method set. Okay, so now I, my error message went away for ID, social security number, and for my person. But I still have an error message for this floating point value. So we can easily rectify that by removing that value. And so now if we run our code, invalid memory address, we try to call the print method on a nil value. We know how to fix that. We can easily just simply say that we'll check each value when we iterate over the range of um, values passed in E, we will check and see if it's nil. And if it's nil, we will print that out. This is a nil value. So let's see if that resolve our problem. Let's clean up and run again. And no, it doesn't. We see it so it's a nil value. But what we forgot to do is since we're in a for loop, we need to skip once we hit this condition, we need to go to the next value in the range. And we can do that by saying continue. And so let's clean up and run and notice no, this works correctly. So we can deal with a nil value. So let's look at this example. In this example, I'm looking at a function that returns an interface as its type. I have a function get value. It does not take any parameter, but it returns printer as its type. Now remember, 
printer is an interface. So what it, this is saying is that I can return values that satisfy the printer interface. And so we simply take that value that's return, pass it to this print function or print lint function, which is the same function we had before. So let's run this code. And just as we expected. What about if we try to return different values from this function? What I've added, so now we have two types with the implementation of that interface. And in get value, what I've done is change it a little bit. So we create a channel and we spin up a go routine to go off and start sending either zero or one on that channel as we request it. And so we will request a value. It's going to be either zero or one. If it's zero, we return a social security number. If it's one, otherwise we return an ID. In my main, I simply ask for a value, print it out, ask for another value and print it out. So let's run the code and see. And as you can see, this time I get two IDs. What we've demonstrated is that a function that has as a return type a, an interface can simply return a value that satisfies that interface. So, okay, so that's it. See you in the next lecture. Take care. Bye. So let's take a look at your exercise for lecture four. So I'll go open stub, exercise four, click on read me. And in this exercise, it's similar to your exercise in lecture three. If you did the exercise for lecture three, we did this word count package and we count how many times that right method was called. We'll modify this slightly. So let's read it. Complete the package WC such that the Golang application runs correctly. The package WC provides a type write counter, which implements the write interface shown below and the FMT stringer interface. Write counter must keep track of how many times the write method is called and how many bytes were written to the value. So this should really be, you know, something like and, yep, to really call that out. And so your first to do then is you have to define an appropriate write counter type. Now, in the previous exercise in exercise three, we use an unsigned int. That's not going to be appropriate because we need to keep track of two values. And the second thing is, to, of course, to implement the write interface. The third thing is to implement the stringer interface. And we should have that from before, except now you will update the output so that it includes, in addition to how many operation, it should say how many bytes were written to that interface. Finally, we have this function called store data. And it's a function in our main package. That's why I call it main that store data, taking these two parameters and of course write those slice of string to your write interface and the end result should be printed on the screen. So if we take a look at my code, the solution, this is what it would look like. So you can see it's saying that something is missing and that is because I have two files here in my package and the data that go represent the data I want to pass to that function you have to call, which is the store data function. And you can see in my example, when I run this, it's well, because I don't use any random data or anything, so I'll get the same result. So I call write six times and the total is 64 bytes. Welcome to lecture five in section nine. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at type assertion. So what is type assertion? Well, we'll see that with type assertion, it's gonna allow us to reveal the dynamic type of a value. We'll also be looking at something called type switch. And that is the ability to be able to use the type as a switch condition, and then that allow us to do some interesting things. So let's just jump in and look at some illustration of what you mean by dynamic type. And if you remember, Go is a statically typed language. So your alarm bells are probably going off as to why we have dynamic type then in Go, because every type in Go has a known type when it's created, and that type remain with it until the very end. Well, let's go back and look at our variable foo. And foo, remember, is an interface variable. And what we've said is since foo is a variable of an empty interface, it can be assigned any value. The only difference here with foo is that it's storing information about the value that is assigned to it somewhere else. So as a result, 
foo has this interesting property or effect where it looks like if the type of foo is changing because we can then assign another value and we can say, well, oh, foo has a different value type now, a different value and a different type. But that's not really what's happening. Foo's type is still interface, an empty interface, but the value that is stored in foo, its type is, is what is changing. We can then say we have this idea of a dynamic type versus a static type. The static part is the type for foo that is not changing. The dynamic part is what foo can store. And so if we get rid of some of the noise and we say, well, what is foo's type? We answer this already. Its type is still going to be the static type with the interface to foo. We can also ask, well, if we create another variable called goo based on the assignment of assigning foo to it, what is the type of goo? And we can also ask, what if we create a second variable who and assign it the value of foo after it's been assigned a different value? What is the type of who? So these are some of the questions that come up if you sort of assign or store different values in foo, but then if you use foo to create other variables, what are those variables type, right? And so the thing to remember is that the variable foo has a static type and its type is interface, an empty interface. The dynamic type of foo is these guys, the float64 or pointer to person. And because foo static type is empty interface, it means then that when we create a variable like goo or who based off of foo, it doesn't matter what other value we had stored in who, those variables are going to get the static type of who. So that static type of who is going to be in an empty interface. So this is sort of abstract right now. And if you get it, great. But let's just augment what we've just said with some code. So let's jump into our code. So let's look at a slightly different example. And here we're trying to understand what type assertion is. We haven't done it yet but that's the topic we're working on now. So let's say I have my interface variable foo, and of course I can assign a value to it, and this time I'm assigning a floating point number to foo. Now imagine that I then declare a variable f, and I would like to get the value, the float64 value from foo into f. Now we saw before that I could not assign foo to f, because they're two different types. So here I'm trying to cast my foo, the value that's in foo to flow 64. And of course you can see after my over over, it's telling me that I cannot cast it. And it also tells me that I need type assertion. So at this point, the question is what is type assertion? So I cannot cast it. So what, else can, what can I do to get that value? Now we know we could print it, but what can I do to get the value, that flow 64 value, from foo into f. And that is where we need to do a type assertion. And this is what a type assertion look like. And if you look, you can see it just sort of transposed things around a bit. So we're saying that I know that you have a flow 64 value, so give that to me. And then now we can print out the value of f. And if we were correct in retrieving that value, and we don't see an error now, we should see that all we get back 1971.07. And there it is. We get back f is 1971 and it's a type of So there's more to type assertion. And the question that you should probably be asking yourself, what if we had another value or a value of a different type stored in our interface variable? What would happen if we tried to assert that we are indeed looking for float64, but it wasn't float64? So let's take a look at that. So in this example, this is exactly what we had before. We restore a float64 value in foo. We assert that we have a float64 value. We print it out and we expect this to work. Now we store an integer value in foo and we're going to test that we do have an integer value. Now we're saying, can I get a float64 value from foo? And 
notice we don't have an error here because this is runtime. Go doesn't know when you will assign different values to foo and so on. So let's see what happened when we run our code. Our program dies. So we got up to the point where we could print out that foo does have the integer value seven, but notice it says interface conversion, interface, empty interface is not int, it's actually, um, it's int, not float 64, right? So you can see that this can cause your program to crash if you don't have a proper way or if you don't know for sure what should be stored in this interface, um, what type is stored in the interface variable. And if this was the only way to do it, then you'll always be guessing and at the risk of crashing your program. Thankfully, there's a way to get around this. So let's take a look at that example. So let's start with this function called getValue. And notice it's returning a value that satisfies the empty interface type. So we'll make a channel of capacity one and we'll do a select and try to send one of these four values. We don't know which one, it's gonna be random. So we can either send an int, a float, a string, or a pointer to this composite literal. And so we will return that. So that's how we get a value. When we run our program, we don't know which one of these value we'll get. And so if you look at main, the only thing that's different in main, I still have foo as an interface variable. So if I get that value and I print it out, we'll see what type it is and the value. Now here's the interesting part. We're still using type assertion, but notice now we're saying foo.int and we're saying also tell me if what I'm asking for is really stored in um, what you have stored. And so by asking for the Boolean OK, we're saying if it is an int stored in, in value, this variable, also tell me whether or not you are able to retrieve an int. And so if this is true, that means that we, we did get back an int. And if it's false, then we didn't. And so I essentially go down and I say, if we didn't get an int, is it a float? If we didn't get a float, is it a string? If it's not a string, did we get a pointer to a person? So that's all there is. But notice now my program is not going to crash because I'm asking if a string is stored in there and I get back a variable that tells me that and I can check that variable. Okay. So let's run this code. And as you can see that all the other ones did not print out because we were only able to get a float that time. If we run again, we got float 64 again. This time we have person, pointer to person. We have an integer value, and as you can see, each time we run, this time we got a string, and we can correctly deal with it without our program dying. So let's look at another way of using type assertion. So this is essentially the same code I had before. I haven't changed my get value function, but what I've done is I've gotten rid of the if test, and instead, what I've done is I'm going to print out whether we got okay or not. And by printing out both, both values, we get to see when the assertion fail, not only will we get false, but what value do we get um, stored in our variable, for example. And so if we, and, and we can guess, right? In Go, we know that if you try to declare a variable of a certain type, you get the zero value of it. And so we should expect when we ask for an int, if we can get an int, this should be zero. Similar for float, we should get a zero. For a string, we should get an empty string. And for pointers, we should get nil because those are the zero value for any one of those variables of those types. So, but let's run and just confirm that that's what we get. And so we can see that when we ask if we get an, if there's an integer stored in um, that foo variable, it was false. And so we get back to a zero. Similarly for float, and it was a string, so we got back true and there's a the string value. And then when we ask if it's a pointer to a person, that was false, and we get back nil pointer. And we can, of course, run, keep running this, and this time we got a float value, and we got pointer to person. So you get the idea. Safely, not only check, but also know that we get a sane value back. But the nice thing about using the Boolean is that what if a zero was stored in that value? Well without being able to check if it's okay, you wouldn't know that. So let's look at our last example with type switching. And so in this example, I've simply added a few more values to my get value function. So I've added, 
a boolean i've added a complex number and the only other thing i've added is this other type id which is a type defined of id as having the on the line type string if we just scroll past this print function for now and we we'll just focus on what i'm doing in main in main i simply have a for loop that's going to get 10 values and i call this my print function well since get values return in an empty interface my print also accept empty interface and so let's look at my print so my print is using the switch statement and type assertion the thing that's different is here we have an interface variable x and it's using the what look like our type assertion except that instead of asking for a specific type it is using this keyword type and it's essentially saying hey i don't know and i don't want to assume what type you have stored x but i want you to tell me what that type is and so this statement will then return the type that is stored and because we're using a switch now we can say if that type from x is boolean we know it's boolean so we can print out an appropriate message and of course if we know that the type stored in x is boolean then we can of course ask for the boolean value you see before when we we have to be careful if we ask for a type a value of a certain type from an interface variable and we weren't sure what's stored in it because then if we were wrong our program would crash and the only way around that was to then ask for two values where we would have to check if it was true or false but no we don't have to do that because once we get to this line we know that this case was true and therefore the value in x is a boolean so we can explicitly ask a boolean and so with the other cases too and notice we can even ask for is the case or the type of that x or custom type which is a pointer to person now remember we also had a second type id so we can potentially get that type too but because we didn't test for that we're going to use the default to say you know what i do not know what type this is right according to our switch statement according to our switch statement these are the type we're looking for and if there are any other type we're going to say we don't know what type that is but of course, we can still, you know, print it out and so on. And that is just to prove that once we get this unknown, it should be the ID type, main that ID, because that's the only type we do not have in our list, given that the values that we can return. Okay. So if we should run this code now, I hope. And so we can see, um, we sat in the for loop. And at some point, we got an unknown type according to our case statement. We on un uh, unknown type because we weren't checking for id and we got complex twice and person and so on but you can see and we can run this again and we get different thing but it doesn't change how our switch statement work using type assertion with the type switching so that's still type assertion but now we're we're switching on type so there's one other thing that i want to show you and that is a pitfall with type assertion that you should be very careful about and so let's say that i have a variable foo try to get a value as an interface variable and then call the interface variable type you'll see that we're getting an error in this case and it's telling us that you cannot use the that type outside of a type switch that is essentially the pitfall but you shouldn't be able to fall into it because the compiler is going to catch you trying to use this outside of a switch statement so you sort of don't have to worry about it but you might just be curious to know if you see this here you might say well okay can i then use this standalone and the answer is no that's it no exercise see you in the next video take care bye welcome to lecture six in section nine and in this lecture we're going to be talking about assignability so what is assignability assignability is really when can you assign a value to a variable so when is this allowed so we know that oh, there are certain values that must have a specific type before you can assign them to a variable. More specifically, the value type and the variable type must match, but there are few conditions in which they don't have to be identical, but they can be close and they still work. The topics we're gonna to be looking at in this lecture are when are types assignable 
And when are name types versus on name types the same? And when are they different? Let's keep it simple. Let's start off slow. And so for that, we'll jump to the code. And I'll start by closing up the side panel of the Explorer to give us some more space. And let's look at what types I have to clear here. For all intents and purposes, I've introduced a new type called ID, and it is different from a string. You cannot use a string and an ID interchangeably without some casting, but we'll see that. And then I have SKU, which is also a new named type, and it is, it's on the line storage is also a string. So what we want to see is if a values of type string, for example, can be assigned to variable ID or values of type SKU can be assigned to an ID given that they both have the same underlying storage. So we'll look at that in a minute. But before we move on and take a look at that, let's look at some other types I have. So I have person type, which is a struct, and it has two fields, name that is string and age that is of this type age. And age for reference is just an unsigned eight. But notice individual. Individual and persons are declared identically. So they are identical in every way except for the fact that they have different names. Okay. I remember we said that those structs are used for laying out of memory, saying how memory is laid out. So a variable of person, a variable of individual will both, given if they have the same value, would be laid out in memory exactly the same way. Right? Because the two types are identical in their definition. It's just that they have different names. Okay. So let's look at um, variables and how we values and how we can assign them to variables. So if I have a value of 1,971 and I assign it to a variable i0, in this case, I'm saying that I want this type for this variable to be in 16. Now, I declare a second variable i1. But because i1's type is in 16, and we know that the value stored in i0 is in 16, then we can easily assign the value in I0, that's going to be read from I0. The value of I0 is going to be read and stored in I1 and no problem with that. And I can print those out to demonstrate it, but because we know that's going to work, I'm not going to waste time sort of running the code right now. Now, let's look at name types. And the key thing here is name types are always different, always. On the, every situation, there's no exception. Name types are always different. So I have a name type call ID, and I'll create a value of type ID. And this is how I do it when um, I have, a, for example, a, the type ID is whose underlying type is a string. I can use a string to create a value, but notice I'm casting that value to ID. And so now I store it in my variable ID0, and I do the same thing with SKU. Now we can print out those values and their corresponding type, and we'll see that all they have different types. So if we do, for example, this and something maybe like that, just to show that all we can get the value and the variable, the type. Uh, seems like I can't type. And so there we go, ID zero and SKU. And so I can print that out, but I'll get an error if I try to assign SKU or try to read the value of SKU and assign it to ID0 because the value of SKU, while it's on the line type is a string, the value of it is type SKU. And SKU and ID are different types. And so I cannot assign them even though they have the same on the line type. And so if I were to uncomment this, uh, well, uncomment the wrong line, but if I were to uncomment this, we'll get an error if we try to compile or run our code. And so we can see that here. Uh, see, cannot use type SKU as type ID because they are different type. So if we comment that out, We can run our code and you can see that we have this value and the type is main ID. This other value, its type is main SKU. And I, we've seen this before, but we haven't really 
stop to really think that name types are always different. Okay, the next example is Jane, person, and Bob. And you know what this is going to be because this is the exact same thing as above. It doesn't matter that in this case we are using a simple underlying type or here we have struts. These are name types and so they are very different. And if we try to assign one to the other, we'll get the same error message that we cannot assign a person to an individual because a value of type person to a variable of type individual because they're different type. So, okay, let's look at a slightly different example. So in this example, I haven't changed the type that I have defined previously. So the only thing we're doing now is looking at when is it appropriate to assign values of an unnamed type to a variable of a name type. So for example, we know that we have this name type person, so we create a variable of type, uh, a variable p0 of type person. We create a variable p1 of the unnamed type, but it has the same layout. Notice it has the exact same layout in memory as our person. So, but it's an unnamed type. So it's an unnamed struct, yada, yada, yada. So when are they assignable? They are assignable when the field names, for example, are identical with the same type. So they must look identical in every way. But notice one is named and the other is unnamed. And so when that is the case, I can assign between them. So you can see here I can assign P1, which is the unnamed struct, to P0, the name struct, or I can do the other way, P0, the name struct, to the unnamed um, variable type. And that also works. I, I, we can run this to see, but if it didn't work, uh, I would get an error. So it is working. I didn't print out anything, but we know that how it's working. Now, the final example is when we have different, um, not only types, but maybe the order is different. So notice that P2 is a variable of also on name struct. In this example, the field names are the same, but notice the order is different. So we have age coming first instead of name. Because the field order is different, that alone ensures that a variable of this unnamed struct or this unnamed type cannot be assigned to a name type even if they have the same field names because the order is different. And the same thing would happen if you change the type. Even if you had the order correctly, and the case, you had a uppercase for one of the field name or a different type, again, that makes them two different types that you cannot assign. And so we'll get some error here if we try to assign, to run, assign any one of these. And so it tells you why. Okay. All right, so let's look at another example. So this example is slightly different than our previous example. We have our P3, which is a unnamed struct. And notice the first two fields are exactly like what we would have in individual or person. But still, if we were to create a variable of P0 for person, We will still have an error trying to assign this the variable that is represented by p3 because its type is on name struct name age social security number even though we still have a subset um, that we would need to initialize or copy to p0 this still cannot be assigned okay um, go doesn't want to do anything that dangerous to make assumptions about which field should be used. is either they're identical or they are not. All right? So there we go. Cannot assign it. So this last example is exactly what we mentioned before. We said that even if you had the same type in the same order as a name type, for example, in the case of person or individual, where we had uh, we have the types in the same the same types, so they have the same layout and memory. The fact that their field names are different, this also means that they cannot be assigned. 
and so we can see that if we try to comment this code and run it but hopefully you get the gist that unless they are identical in a way that doesn't cause any ambiguity go will not assign them and even when you wouldn't have any ambiguity like in the case of a value of id and a value of sku you still cannot assign them because the name types are always different and you do not want to introduce the idea that oh, um, go can look and see oh the underlying type is the same as therefore i assigned it if code depend on that then maybe somebody might update it to be a struct or something and then your code suddenly breaks so it's good that go treats name type as different types okay so that's it um no exercise for this lecture because our next lecture is going to be a review of section nine and we'll have a lab so take care see you in the next lecture bye let's take a look at the labs for section nine actually there's just one so what is our lab well i figured out with all the things we have learned so far and especially in what we learned in section nine we can write a mem store so what is a memory store well a memory store is an object in which we can store data and retrieve data as well so think of it as an in-memory database if you like a poor man's in-memory database some people might call it a buffer and in memory store can be used when you're expecting data to come in at different rate and you want to even out how that data is delivered you can use an in-memory data store to buffer the data so let's go back a little bit and think about what we've covered so far in this lecture and how it ties into what we want to do so let's think about writing data so imagine that i have a type called memstore and for now it doesn't really matter what i'm using to implement my type and so we know that when you have a type t and in this case memstore you can hang some methods onto it and so in this case we're going to hang this method right i've left off the return types for our write method and instead simply say that it accept a slice of bytes because i really want to make a point with that now since my memstore type has this method defined for it called write which you can in which you can pass some bytes well if we really look at the implementation of how we got there we can see it all, all we have is a function write and it has a receiver memstore now in this example i my receiver is a pointer and the reason for that is because if i'm going to be writing data into my memstore i need to modify that memstore so getting a copy of memstore wouldn't be a correct implementation so hence why i need a pointer now i've left out a lot of details but that doesn't really matter if you look at our comment we can just simply say so when we when i use a call right with some slice of bytes what we want to do is take those bytes and add it to our some data member of our uh, mem store and so if we can find a way in which we can remember the bytes that were written then we will have implemented some storage mechanism that you can at least write to we haven't talked about reading yet but at least you can write data to it let's move on we're, we're ignoring the de details for now and so i just want you to think about it i want to illustrate the thing we're trying to do and give you some time to think about it because this is your lab but i at least want to go over what is expected now this idea of a mem store like i said is something that you can actually use in a lot of application but even if you step outside of storing things in memory and you say our type netcom represent the, a type that abstracts how you would write data to the network and again it provides this method right same exact method you can see that instead of now copying data or adding data to some in memory device um, buffer location in the case of memstore for netcom or for a network connection object we can or value rather we can maybe it hides you know detail about the device the online operating system device and we can say well we want to copy the slices the set of bytes from b to that um, device or maybe it's something that allows us to access the operating system to be able to send that data out so our write method 
is really a nice abstraction for saying take some data and either send it or store it or associate it in some way as being stored or sending it to uh, a type. Or simple memstore wouldn't be much use if we all we can do is just write data into it. We want to be able to put data into our memstore and then take it back out. And so we have a corresponding read method. And so we can imagine that our read method is implemented something like this. And the only difference here is that now when we call read, the user or the caller of this read method on an appropriate memstore value will provide a buffer where we should store bytes that we have in our memstore into. So now we're copying data, not from slice to our memstore data, but rather out of our memstore data to that slice. So that is essentially what you have to implement. Okay. So let's take a look at what it might look like if we write to our memory store. Let's assume that our memory store will be implemented by using a slice of bytes. One of the things that we must say is that we have a maximum capacity in our memory store. Since we do not want users of our memory store to keep writing, 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 and potentially um, fill up all the memory in our system or allocate, cause us to allocate all the memory that's available to us and cause the program or their program to crash. So we'll start off with them having to tell us how big or the memory store should be. So in this example, we have a memory store that we're going to say is 16 bytes. And so we dropped in our index to show that. So we have from zero to 15, which is 16 bytes. So let's say before we do any writes whatsoever, we're keeping track of a few things. So we have a write offset. This is gonna be, where should we write the next set of data that the user passed to us? And so then we have our write method, and this is the meta method attached to our memstore type. And so a value of memstore would be able to call this method. And then we have the return values, n and error. And we wanna take a look at what happens when we call write to write some data, uh, what happens with the return and so on. So our first write, let's say the a user of our mem store, when our write offset is pointing to zero because it's empty, we haven't written anything, and then the user call write and passes in, they say hi, you know, cast i to a slice of bytes. So if we're doing ASCII characters, that's just going to be two bytes. And so we should return, or our write function should return that, yes, I have stored your two bytes and there's no error in me being able to store that. Now, if the user then calls our write function again, the second time before they call the write function, notice how our write pointer have advanced by two bytes. So now it's pointing to the memory location where we can start writing new bytes again. And so we're gonna start writing the second set of data that the user has given us. And this time the user has given us 14 bytes to write. And because we have 14 bytes available, we can write all or store all 14 bytes. So we return that we can store 14 bytes and there's no error. How do I know that we have 14 bytes? Well, so once we finish storing the 14 bytes, now if the user tries to write another byte, and notice they're only trying to run, write one byte. But at this point, our, our write offset is one past the location that is valid for us our new offset is 16, so we could not write to that location. So that's why we say we return to the user that we weren't able to store any of your data. And the reason why is because our buffer or our memory store is full, so that's the error. So, okay, so let's look at reads. So once we're ready to read data, now that we've written some data, we cannot write anymore, this is what our storage look like. Now for spaces, to make it visible and easy to visualize, I'm using those fancy little um, little things here. I don't know what you call them, but I'm using this to represent a space. So it's a little bit more visual. So this is what our storage look like now. Now, before we can read anything, we need to a buffer or uh, a slice to store it in a byte slice. Because remember, this is the parameter that our read function expects. So we're going to be reading from where? Well, if we write something into our memory buffer, and we write a few things rather, when we write to read, we should expect to read the first things that we wrote in. So when we do a read, this is what it looks like. Our write offset is still pointing to the end pass or valid offset because it's full. 
And when we say, try to read into a buffer, when we call a read method with buffer as a parameter, because we made it with a length of eight and a capacity of eight, our read function, actually we don't really need to worry about the capacity, our read function simply look at the length of the, the slice and say, oh, this is how many bytes I can copy into this buffer. And so it say, oh, you have a buffer that's eight bytes, I can give you eight bytes. And because it can give you eight bytes, we return the value, um, the number eight, and no error because we were able to copy out eight bytes. And so after this call to read, this is what our buffer looked like. So we start off with write offset being at the end. We call read function, we get this result out, and this return these return values. Now, after we have read those, we have to shift things now. Why? Because another way of doing it was to advance the read pointer to this location to say, let's start reading from eight. And of course, this data would have been up here. But that would have been harder to handle if the user then, after, before they read out the second set of data, chose to wrote, write something into a memory store. Then we'll have to shift things around and it's just more painful and harder to deal with. So it makes sense and it's fairly easy to do using the copy um, function that's built into Go that you get as one of the built-in function. You can use the copy function in both the writing and reading methods and it makes what we I'm illustrating very easy. And you can take a look at the solution, but try it first based on what you know the copy function experiment. But um, if you're stuck, definitely look at the solution. So now we've shifted down the remaining data down to the beginning of our slice. It means that our read offset never changes. Our read offset is always at zero regardless of how much data we read out. And so now at the beginning of this read operation, our write offset, notice where it is, is pointing to the next available location where we can write. And this is consistent with what we said. Somebody should be able to write into our buffer, either fill it up or not fill it up, read out at any time and then write. So they can mix reading and writing as much as they like. And so this allowed them to know, since we have some space in the buffer, start write some more data in and choose to read it out however they want. And so now if we try to read out this data, notice we'll get the space, is space nice. And this time we'll get also eight because the buffer we're using says, oh, you can store eight bytes. And that's what we have here from zero through seven, eight bytes and we get no error. If the user tries to read again, let's look at what our memory look like. Our memory store is empty. They've read out everything. This is just as if they started off with a new mem store and we didn't know anything about them writing and reading out everything, but this is the initial condition back again. And so now if they try to read some data, again, our read offset is still at zero, but now our write offset is at zero also. And so they shouldn't be able to read out any data. And because we cannot, we're returning less than they've asked for, notice the, the parameter would dictate how much they're asking for, which in this case would be eight, because this is the, parameter we pass into our read method. And so now we should be able to tell them that's empty. Now, assuming that we, if we go back to the previous slide and assuming that they pass us a buffer that let's say this was 10, we should, we would still return eight, but in this case, our error message would be empty because we're saying, well, we give you less than you asked for the 10 bytes you asked for. But the reason for that is because it's empty. Okay. This is essentially all you need to do for this lab is to implement this memory store with a read and write method. Now let's go take a look at uh, README and some of the stubs that I gave you already. And so you can see the details of what is it that is missing. I'm in my Visual Studio code again, and we're looking at the labs for this section. And let's start with the README. And we'll close it up for a bit. And essentially it's exactly what I I showed you in the slides. And so here is I complete the implementation for a type memstore such that it implements an in-memory byte storage. And as we can see the methods that were associated with our memstore, we said they were was write and read. And so we're gonna think of storing data in terms of bytes. The use case is that a memstore value can accept a number of bytes written to it using write method up to the specified capacity. Now, why do we want a specified capacity? Because if someone misuses our 
value and just keep writing, writing, and writing, we might just consume a lot of the system resources and cause our application to crash or their application to crash. So we want them to start off by saying how many bytes maximum we should be able to accept. So once that's addressed or agreed upon, then they can start writing bytes. And of course they can read bytes and they don't have to wait until they filled up the buffer before they can read. They can write 10 bytes, read four, and then write 10 more and then read six and so on. There are a few things that I put down here as a to do's. So you want to be able to declare an appropriate mem store. After you've done that, the other thing you want to do, of course, is implement functions. Now, one of the functions to help you with or help the user in creating a valid mem store value that you can use is if you implement a function called new mem store. And this is just a function. It's not a method. It's just a standalone function. And you can have it take a capacity parameter and it return value is a mem store. And then, of course, you want to implement the IO writer interface. So where's the IO writer interface? Well, that is defined here. So I define, so there's the IO package in the lab and I define this writer interface. It's writer interface and it has this one method write. Notice, it takes byte slice and return number of bytes that were written or accepted and an error if all the bytes the user specify in the slice couldn't be stored. The next to do is to implement IO reader interface. The IO reader interface is going to be what's defined here and it looks pretty much exactly like the right interface. So there's the definition for the interfaces that you need to implement. Finally, these are the requirements. Well, specifically, if you're trying to write to your mem store and it, there's no more place for to all data, then it should return that it's full. And I'll go over that in a minute. Or it should return that it's empty when you try to read data and you've read out all the data. And I've written some tests for you. And this is to make sure that oh, your implementation satisfy the requirement. And so I've written the test already. So all you have to do is implement the code. So take, for example, in this directory memstore. So there is this function new that you have to complete right in. So I've started it for you. Again, it takes a capacity and it returns a memstore object and an error if, for example, it can't allocate this memstore. And so you should complete that implementation. And the test for this function is in new.go. So here's the implementation and the test. So you can either test this function by opening this file and clicking run test in which case it would fail because it's not properly implemented. Or you can simply type go test at your command line to run all the test cases, okay? Or in this package rather. So if you wanted to test everything, so I'm in the solutions directory. See so if I wanted to write, run the test for everything in this package, I'll type go test. And it tells me that all the tests passed. So similarly with all the other ones, um, you would start off of course with to do number one and you'd define an appropriate type. So I tried to give you some tips here. For example, I've already defined a variable for errorful, which is what you would return when someone is trying to write and the mem store is full, or error empty, which is what you return when the, and they try to read and there's no more data. You will declare your type. Here's a tip. Whatever buffer you're using um, to store data that's being written to your mem store, remember, you have to store as much as the user defined in the capacity when they call the new function. You will always be writing from some offset in that buffer. So if you imagine that when the, before the user wrote anything the first time, this write offset is at the beginning of your buffer. And so as you write some data in, of course, that moves the write offset. So the next time that they try to write something, this would again move down. Now, at any time, like I said, the user can read. So they can write some data, write some more data, write some data, but at any time they can read. And so if they try to read, they always read from the beginning of your buffer. So what does this mean? Let's imagine that oh, they've written some data and then they try to read and they read only this much. What this means is after they finish copying this, what you must do 
is copy these two these two remaining bytes or whatever remaining data to the beginning that way when they call read again they do not reread the whole data the old data but rather they reread they read the remaining data now this is simpler than if you had to keep the data and then re remember some read pointer and all this other stuff it can get very complicated so i decided to make it very very simple and it's not as hard as you think just give it some thought and especially if you're using a slice or for or an array for your um to store your data it is not bad remember that we have built-in functions like copy for example so keep that in mind the other thing is the test functions are there to help you make sure that oh, you have it correctly not for you to really review um you probably be a little bit confused if you try to look at a test function um i didn't try to write them in a way that you're supposed to review them they're just supposed to dare to validate your code now finally if your code pass all the tests then you should be able to exercise your package using the main program I, i've written so you do not have to write the main program i've already written it and so if you did the mem store correctly then it simply tried to write some data to the mem store and then it simply copies it out so that's it hopefully you can get that done